Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. I'm glad we're here today to all learn together about this very important topic. My name is Naomi Hoffer, and I am privileged to be the program manager for the UCSF Sherry Sobrato Brisson Brain Cancer Survivorship Program, whose mission is to help enhance wellness and quality of life of those living with brain cancer through a variety of programming that fosters peer community connections, provides professional guidance, and offers regular group class instruction. You will find more information on all of our programs, including video recordings from this and other webinar offerings on our Brain Tumor Center Supportive Care Services website. With us also today here in the Zoom background is my wonderful colleague, Mary Destry, who is our Supportive Care Program Coordinator and Marin Community Liaison. You may be seeing posts from Mary in the chat box as we mention resources throughout this webinar. So I'd like to start off with a quick overview. Um, we're going to talk about brain cancer and some of the common effects experienced by survivors. Then we're going to do a deep dive into exercise and learning about the psychological and biochemical ways that it impacts the brain and body. And we'll hear research on the impact of exercise with symptom management and survival. And I'm really thrilled that we'll be able to hear directly from two of our survivors on how exercise has played an important role in their treatment, recovery, and ongoing management of brain cancer. Then we'll hear some very important safety considerations and finally, how you can get started in building your own effective exercise program. You'll have a chance to submit questions using the Q&A function on your Zoom controls, and we will invite everyone to stay after the show for an unrecorded exercise experiential where we'll be led through five effective movements that we can all do in our homes with no equipment. So now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our two main presenters for the educational content of today's presentation. Dr. Shannon Fogg is an internationally recognized radiation oncologist and integrative oncologist with special expertise in working with brain tumor patients. She is a faculty member at the UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Health with a clinical practice and research program focused on improving quality of life in patients living with brain tumors. And Dr. Karen Wonders is a professor and program director of exercise physiology at Wright State University and the founder and CEO of Maple Tree Cancer Alliance, a nonprofit organization that provides free exercise training to thousands of cancer survivors every month across the U.S. and with office locations in 10 countries. An avid researcher, Dr. Wonders is committed to evidence-based practice and has a robust research program that has published two textbooks, four book chapters, and more than 70 peer-reviewed manuscripts on the topic of exercise and cancer recovery. Dr. Wonders has given numerous professional presentations, including a TEDx talk on exercising through cancer care. Her passion is to advocate for exercise to be part of the national standard of care for cancer. Dr. Fogg and Dr. Wonders, thank you so much for being here with us today. And Dr. Fogg, I will turn it over to you to start us off on this topic. Thank you so much. So happy to be here with all of you tonight. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Is everybody able to see the slides okay? That looks great. Thank you. Perfect. So um, I first just want to start with acknowledging that exercise after a diagnosis of a brain tumor is likely going to look very different than physical activity or exercise uh, you might have done before having the diagnosis or treatment for a brain tumor. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for this. Uh, we can start with the fact that there are intrinsic symptoms that can come about when patients are diagnosed with a brain tumor. And these can include headaches, seizures, uh, problems with memory, um, inability to process information, um, you know, or cognitive changes, problems with speech, visual uh, changes, um, and often changes in our motor control or difficulty with balance. Um, but in addition to this, there's the impact of the treatment itself, which often includes surgery to remove the tumors, radiation, which is helping to disable cell reproduction, and chemotherapy, which is also working to impact tumor cells. And these together um, can really further exacerbate symptoms, even leading to worsening symptoms of neurocognition. We might have slower processing 
it's harder to focus or pay attention. Um, our short term memory might be impacted. Um, and in addition, we have in particular from radiation, uh, symptoms of fatigue, uh, we can have headaches, uh, and again, some of these other, uh, symptoms, uh, problems with our motor function or balance. Um, and this can, uh, lead to, uh, symptoms, uh, in addition to those physical symptoms of having more anxiety more depression, decreased quality of life, um, and even feeling the impact of the medication side effects. And those can include medications like Keppra, which are often used for seizure control. Um, but steroids are also something that can really impact not only mood, sleep, um, but also actually weaken some of our muscles that we previously used. Uh, we call these our proximal muscles. These are muscles that help us climb up stairs or even stand up from a sitting position. So um, these, you know, certainly the treatments, the intrinsic nature of the tumor, as well as medications can really make it challenging to exercise in the way that um, you might've been exercising before this diagnosis. Um, so when we think about exercise, I think it's important to recognize that this is actually something that's recommended by the American Cancer Society to impact not only quality of life, but survival. And a lot of this research has been focused on more common cancers like breast cancer and prostate cancer, but there are a lot of studies that have been done on patients with brain tumors that have shown similar successes. Um, we know that there are so many benefits that come with exercise, including a decrease in stress and anxiety, can actually improve focus, balance, flexibility, our neurocognition, and even inflammation. And inflammation is an important one to recognize. Um, it, we also know that exercise can improve our functional status, um, quality of life, and I'll show some slides that show its impact on survival as well. I think it's important to recognize that there are very few reports of any adverse effects with exercise. So this is something that is safe to do. Um, and just, you know, being mindful of limitations and building up and not trying to do it again, where you were before this diagnosis and treatment started. Um, when we think about the benefit of exercise on the brain in particular, um, it's important to think that, you know, not only is it, it impacting all those things I mentioned, but this can actually be improving our, what we call neuroplasticity. It's, it's rewiring, regrowing parts of the brain. And that's leading to a lot of these improvements I'm going to be talking about. Um, there is a uh, something called a brain derived neurotropic factor or BDNF. And this is actually something that's increased with exercise it helps and has been noted uh, to have a role in neuroplasticity and connectivity. It actually can help with the structure and function of parts of the brain, uh, such as the hippocampus, which is a part that is really impacting our memory and cognitive function. It can actually impact metabolic functions like glucose uptake, fat oxidation, as well as cardiovascular health. Um, and in, interestingly, in individuals who have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or dementia or other cognitive impairments, these patients tend to have a lower level, overall level of circulating BDNF. So likely is playing a role in that neurocognitive aspect across many different types of uh, brain diseases. Um, we know that aerobic training is improving our executive function. These are the things that help us go to the store and not forget all the items on our list or, um, you know, make it so we don't forget our keys as frequently. So in our executive functioning is a really important part of our brain. Um, and even three weekly sessions can improve executive function and neural efficiency. So that's an important thing to realize is it doesn't mean it has to be every day for several hours a day. The, a little bit can go a long way. Um, and even one bout of exercise can actually lead to increased levels of BDNF, IGF-1, and that's a good thing for our metabolic health and VEGF. It can increase neurotransmitters, the good ones like dopamine and norepinephrine, serotonin, acetylcholine, GABA, glutamate, and even our neuromodulators, including the endogenous opioids and endocannabinoids. And uh, Dr. Wonders will be talking a little bit about that and its relationship to what we call our runner's high. 
Um, I will also say that this can be very impactful on fatigue. And interestingly, when we look at the mechanism of fatigue, we have uh, powerhouses, energy powerhouses in our body called the mitochondria. And it really is a, you use it or lose it phenomenon. When we don't use our, or don't move, don't use these mitochondria, we actually can create vision, which leads to fragmented and dysfunctional mitochondria when we're exercising. And and that's any movement. We are creating better, improved quantities of mitochondria and um, improved quality of mitochondria. And that actually helps us have more energy and build up to that. So important to think about those physiological impact of exercise as well. Exercise is actually an excellent therapy for mood and depression. Even two and a half hours a week actually can reduce the risk of depression by 25%. Um, so this is something also to keep in mind when we think about the benefits of exercise. Um, and it can have a benefit on survival as well. And this is uh, looking at the difference in patients who exercise nine hours a week versus patients that exercise less than nine hours we are seeing an impact on overall survival. So again, one more reason to really think about how we can best incorporate this. Um, and I'll just say that your providers are okay and want you to do this as well. When we surveyed our providers, and this included our neurosurgeons, radiation oncologists, neuro-oncologists, 92% of them felt that exercise was important for our, our patient's lifestyle, that it should be incorporated into our patient's treatment, and that it improved quality of life, including decreasing fatigue and re, uh, decreasing the treatment-related side effects. And yet only 57% of them acknowledged that they actually engaged in discussions about exercise with their patients. And so I just want to stress that it's not because it's not thought to be important. There's lots of factors, including, you know, times of visit, all of that, but that your providers are okay with you doing this and want you to be engaged in movement or exercise. Um, as I said in the beginning, exercise might look different for patients, uh, you know, before and after a diagnosis of a brain tumor. So I want to uh, just mention a few different uh, types of exercise that can really be beneficial and um, might, again, have this mind-body component uh, that it can also be really helpful and beneficial. Um, yoga is something that is considered a discipline of physical and mental, uh, spiritual practice. And this does not have to be the, uh, sort of aerobic, um, type of yoga that we typically picture. There are many different types of yoga, uh, Hatha yoga, restorative yoga, but the Osher center, we have something called laughter yoga. Um, and there's even goat yoga. Um, and when we think about the benefits of yoga, we see actual physiologic benefits, and this can include down-regulated pro-inflammatory markers. I'm a big believer that inflammation is at the core of a lot of our disease processes, including cancer. So having uh, something that's actually lowering these markers is pretty powerful. Um, reducing something like cortisol, which if we think about how, if you've ever been on steroids and uh, how unpleasant that is, cortisol is really a uh, natural steroid in our body and can lead to a lot of things, including downstream inflammation. We see a reduction in blood pressure, lowering our fasting blood glucose. That's super important for any of you who thought about keto diets, sugar being at the center of things. These therapies are actually lowering our blood glucose as well. Um, even lowering cholesterol and increasing the size of the hippocampus. So we're seeing real brain changes from these uh, types of uh, exercise. Again, different from our traditional going out to run for five miles. There's still a lot of benefits for these mind body activities or movement. Um, something like Tai Chi uh, which and Qigong, which are more uh, meditative movements, also have a lot of different benefits, um, including decreased stress and anxiety, uh, improving focus, improving balance. And that's something that a lot of our patients struggle with, um, increasing flexibility, improving neurocognition. And again, decreasing inflammation. So I encourage all of you as you're thinking about how to incorporate exercise into your routine to consider these other things that may not have been part of your regular routine before, but we see a lot of benefits um, from incorporating these. Um, so I am very happy to actually pass the baton over to 
one of our patients who is going to tell us a little bit about his experience with exercise. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it really gives some encouragement and, uh, you know, acknowledgement that, um, this is something you can do. And, um, I, I don't want to speak for him. I want to let him tell his story. So, so I'm going to stop sharing my slides here and pass the baton over to Mark. Thank you for the introduction. And, and I'm really um, pleased to be able to speak with everybody today. Um, I wanted to just talk about my experience with exercise and my personal experience with uh, my brain tumor. I was diagnosed in 2019 with an illegal dendroglioma and had uh, what I think was easiest to describe as the standard of care. I had a uh, brain surgery and followed up by um, uh, radiation chemotherapy, both adjuvant and uh, then a follow-on year of, of Temidar. And so that's sort of where I got to today. Um, and uh, my experience is, is this. When, when I was diagnosed with brain cancer, I um, knew I was in the best hands at UCSF. But I felt like, you know, from the, from the diagnosis through all the treatments, that I was limited to a passive role in the process. Um, I, I, and so while I had great care, I didn't feel like I had agency. And I was looking for something that I could do in a positive way to help my health. And exercise is something I had done all my life. It would play a great role in me, so I turned to that. And um, exercise represented something I could control. Um, it allowed me to set small, measurable goals every day that I could achieve. These victories became bright spots in these days of uncertainty. Um, and I knew I was helping myself in a variety of ways, all the obvious benefits of exercise. But like I said, it also allowed me to feel like I was becoming an active participant in my treatment program. Um, first and foremost, I, I did have to make a very honest assessment of my capabilities. And so when I talk about athletic goals, they were very simple. I think at first it was, well, I'm going to get up and I'm going to, to walk to the bathroom. Now I'm going to do it on the floor above me. And then I'll ultimately, ultimately to take a, a thousand steps. And you can see from the slide, um, after uh, many days, I was able to get to 10,000 steps. And that meant a lot to me. And it was really important. Um, these these pictures depict some of the things I did during my my, my Beach. I struggled with uh, balance, and so going on a walk on the beach um, with this man in particular, it, it allowed me to, in a controlled way, you know, kind of remember what it's like to, to 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 work at balance. That led to me being able to go back to one of my great loves of trail running, where I am Marin um, uh, on the trail, and uh, it was a very short run, but but a really positive experience. Um, these small steps eventually led up, you know, over many many months of time. To me, being points, I think though about all these small little, um, you know, victories along the way, and there were many more in between these. Was that by thinking about uh, by thinking about a goal that I wanted to do by next week or even two weeks from now, I engaged this sense of hope in myself. You know, it, it was assumed that I was going to be there next. week. Oh, sorry, Mark. I think I you're cutting out a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but that's better. Is that okay? That's better. Thank um, you. Great. I, I also found that it, I, or I believe that it, it, it helped my body's ability to heal itself, right? As, as Dr. Fogg mentioned, it did counterintuitively reduce my exhaustion. I would get up in the morning and feel like I can't get out of bed, but if I get out for a walk, five minutes into my walk, my circulatory system started up again and my cardiovascular, you know, kind of uh, energy returned and I could feel my oxygen transport system pushing um, the oxygen out to my limbs and I got energized. It was very, very odd, but very, very real. It also got me out of the house and more integrated into society and into the world. And that was really important psychologically. Um, it activated endorphins, it, you know, improved my, my, my overall outlook on things. So for me, um, it was a very powerful way. Again, it doesn't matter what your goal is. It could be 10 steps. It could be 100 steps. It's really nice to have that. So that was my experience. And I, I hope that this was able to um, give some of um, the people who are listening some ideas. Thank you so much, Mark, for that wonderful accounting of your personal experience with exercise and how it has helped you through your recovery. And I know that we'll have a chance to invite you on again after um, during the Q and A, so that you can be asked a few questions from the audience. So thank you so much. 
Now we're going to bring on Karen Wonders, who will talk about how exercise benefits many of the symptoms associated with cancer and recovery. Karen, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Um, well, my name is Karen Wonders. I'm going to continue on um, and, and just talk some more about some of the benefits be behind exercise and how that can positively impact. Um, you know, you, you just heard Mark's story. You're going to hear Will uh, when I'm done. And I think they're two really great examples of people who have been able to, um, to apply this and see the positive come out of, of what is a difficult situation. Um, and so as, as um, Naomi said, my name is Karen Wonders. I'm the founder and CEO of Maple Tree Cancer Alliance. And I've been doing research in this field for the last 20 years. So um, it's an honor to be here today. Next slide, please. So if you look overall at the benefits of cancer and exercise just in general, you know, it's been very well documented in the literature over the last several decades that there is a very strong correlation between exercise and improved patient outcomes with cancer. And this has led to the endorsement of exercise oncology with several national organizations, some of which we have seen very, very recently, including um, the American Society of Clinical Oncologists, who released guidelines in May of 2022, suggesting that all oncology providers recommend regular aerobic and resistance exercise training during active treatment with curative intent to mitigate the side effects of cancer treatment. That was the strongest um, statement to date by an oncology group. Um, so that's very exciting. And that just goes to show the benefits that exercise can have in an individual who's battling cancer. Now, prior to this in 2019, the American College of Sports Medicine released exercise prescription guidelines highlighting the strong evidence for exercise in the management of anxiety, depressive symptoms, fatigue, quality of life, and physical functions, and then moderate evidence for bone health and sleep in those who are battling cancer. This work by the American College of Sports Medicine contributed to the development and promotion of exercise recommendations for cancer survivors, which state that in general, all cancer survivors should try to avoid inactivity and if possible, aim towards participating in 150 minutes of moderate intense exercise uh, per week, as well as two resistance training sessions. And I understand that might sound like a lot. Um, one thing to keep in mind with this is that you can break these bouts up into five minute bouts, 10 minute bouts, you know, whatever you're able to do that particular day, you can break it up and spread it out throughout the week. It doesn't have to be all at once. Next slide. So now we're going to dial it in just a little bit more and look specifically at the effects of exercise on brain cancer. And the literature, I think it's important to note that the literature that surrounds the specific effects of exercise on patients with brain cancer is limited. Um, this is believed to be reflective of the unique challenges that are experienced by those with brain cancer, including disease and treatment related side effects. Um, this can be anything from instability and fatigue, which makes engaging in exercise particularly difficult in this population. Now, most of the studies that do exist on this uh, population observe that the vast majority of adults with brain cancer were largely inactive from the time of diagnosis through post-treatment. However, they have found that the higher level that exercise was, that was associated with lower severity of brain cancer specific concerns of those individuals who exercised. So kind of like to summarize for those individuals who did exercise, they did tend to have higher quality of life and less severe brain cancer concerns than, um, than what it appeared in individuals who were sedentary. Now, these individuals who were able to stay active or, or to be active during um, cancer treatment, this data shows that these patients were significantly more interested and felt more capable of participating in an exercise program following adjuvant therapy compared to during adjuvant therapy. Approximately equal portions of brain tumor patients preferred exercise at home 
with their spouse or with other family members as opposed to in person or on site. So it was pretty evenly split there. Um, and I think that just goes to show the how our desire is to provide individualized programming, understanding that every individual is going to be different. Now, when I pulled all these studies and looked at them overall, preliminary evidence suggested that exercise is safe, it is feasible, and it is potentially beneficial to brain cancer symptom severity and interference. Of the investigations that were that we examined, 40% of these included just aerobic exercise. 40% of the studies were mixed mode, so that's aerobic plus resistance exercise, and two studies looked at yoga. Now, the frequency of these sessions and the duration of these sessions really ranged between one to six days per week, again, depending on the individual, and they were anywhere from 15 to 60 minutes per length, respectively. Again, only highlighting this need to make these exercise programs individualized to what that particular individual is able to do on that particular day. Exercise intensity ranged from moderate to high intensity, and this was measured by rating of perceived exertion. So in other words, if I were to ask you on a scale of one to 10, how hard do you feel that you're working? If we're looking for a moderate exercise intensity, on a scale of one to 10 to higher intensity would be up to about a seven. That would probably be about as high as we would want to go. So five to seven on a, on a one to 10 um, scale is what we would be looking for. We can also look at your age predicted maximum heart rate and look at a percentage of that. And that's like a calculation that an exercise physiologist can easily do. And if you have an, a wearable tech to try to track your number of steps per day, a lot of times those will give you a heart rate monitor that, you know, as part of the device, you can um, monitor that on your watch. But I generally say as a rule of thumb, if you can still talk, if you're exercising to the point where you can no longer carry on a conversation, you can no longer talk. That means you probably are exercising a little bit too hard. We want to bring you back a little bit, you should still be able to talk. Um, so, um, and then just to kind of summarize all the studies that we looked at, they all degree, they all involved at least some degree of supervision with a qualified exercise professional. The results of these investigations revealed the following, and I think this is really important just to keep in mind all of the numerous benefits um, that exercise can have. So clinically and statistically significant changes in overall symptom severity. So this was able to help people to manage their symptoms that they had. We also saw statistically significant differences in aerobic capacity, body composition, and physical activity levels. And these were supported by randomized clinical control trials, which is the highest level of, um, of trials of, of research that we can, that we look at here with exercise. So the fact that these differences were found are very positive. We also saw clinically significant improvement. This was not statistically significant but it was clinically significant. And these included improvements in neurocognitive domains, particularly as it relates to attention, attention, as well as mental health related quality of life and mood disturbance. Symptom interference with daily life was measured in one RC, uh, randomized controlled trial that we looked at, and that would noted a clinically significant change. There were two randomized control trials that showed um, clinically significant improvements in fatigue and cognition. Now, in terms of functionality, there were clinically relevant improvements observed with lower body strength, balance, quality of life, symptom severity, and interference um, related to brain cancer and brain tumor symptoms as it related to fatigue and sleep following exercise. 
Um, so exercise did impact a lot of areas of, of brain tumor treatments and just its interference on daily life. It is important to note that upper body strength and physical functioning and shortness of breath were assessed as part of these studies. It's back to the types of exercise programs that were in, included in this. Um, although exercise was deemed feasible, the wide range in recruitment and retention rates, so getting people into the study and getting people to stay in the study, that was a little difficult, and that suggests that integrating exercise for a brain cancer population is complex. Um, most of the patients in these studies were newly diagnosed um, and, this, and side effects that they had tend to be a little bit more mild. So there could have been some self-selection here into those studies. But I think the take home message is that exercise is safe and it is beneficial. And if we can individualize an exercise program that's specific to your abilities, your, your needs and, and how you're feeling that day, then, then you can absolutely see benefits from that. And it absolutely can be a part of your daily life. Next slide. So just to summarize it very quick, higher levels of exercise following the diagnosis of brain cancer may be associated with better health outcomes, including higher quality of life, fewer brain cancer specific concerns, and potentially improve survival. Additionally, there is preliminary evidence that suggests that exercise interventions can be safe, feasible, beneficial for symptom management, improving aerobic capacity, body composition, and physical activity. Will, who is another survivor who's going to share um, an inspiring testimony um, for you guys. Hi everyone, I'm Will Pierce, and I'm honestly very excited to do this, this presentation because exercise kind of uh, I think it helped save my life and then give me a better one. So for me, I had January 1st of 2000, uh, 2018, I had a grand mal seizure that shattered my right shoulder, which just shows you that my exercise was a lot more walking than anything. I had surgery a few months later in the end of March, and then for this in San Francisco. My wife and I went to Bottle Rocket after that. It was the end of May. And that was one of those wake up calls where I'm like, what am I doing? It was a lot of people. It was a lot of action. It kind of didn't work well for me just two months after surgery. So I kind of went home and it was one that's filled with, with mind, body, and spirit. And then I didn't have either, any of those. So, you know, mind's just connected with thoughts. Body is just being able to move around. And spirit's just kind of, it might be the connection of all things and seeing life everywhere. So that was when I, I was like, I got to do something here. I didn't know what. So I just started walking and it wasn't easy. So actually to pause in, you see on the left, that's a picture of me probably a month after surgery. And then the middle one is Thanksgiving of the same year. And that's the top of Mount Tam and Marin, which is high. And it was not a piece of cake, but it was like something we could do. It was amazing. So that's kind of the story. And then you'll see my background sunrise, because that's what this is all about. It's about finding your joy and hope and the madness we go through so after like the end of May and beginning of June, I was kind of like a wake up moment of how to get my body back. And that's when I started exercising and it wasn't easy. I mean, I was in my bed for like two and a half months. So, and I was kind of nauseous still. So what I did there is just started easy. I started with like a quarter mile walk with my dog. Then I'd come home and literally listen to a one minute meditation. And that lasted about two weeks. And the quarter mile walk became a or half mile and then became a mile and became two. And then I started to branch out on this and Marin has some of the best hiking in the world. It's just north of San Francisco. I started knocking out a few miles a day. I started doing five to 10 minute meditation and all of that stuff helped my mind, body, and spirit function well, because my body was easy. I was exercising. It became not simple, but just great. And again, no upper body stuff, but tons of walking, but my mind is what really helped out a lot there because it was not as functional. I said a lot of curse words that I didn't mean to, it was just, it was slower. So being on like that now just kind of by myself for a few months just kind of helped me build my mind and my life back. And the spirit was easily there because it honestly helped me show 
at the connection of all things and how life is kind of this beautiful moment, even when you're stuck with cancer. And that's the odd part that made me realize that our own selves, not to fight it, but to fight our own insecurities and own lack of strength. So, you know, I built all that up. I actually went back to work the next year and stayed a year and a half, but then my tumor grew. I took some medication and I had another surgery, oddly enough, last year, July 21st, which is my wife, was my wife and I's ninth anniversary. And that was hard. I did chemo and radiation after that. And I started the program one more time because on chemo, I couldn't even do these hikes. It was like crazy. So then I started the program one more time. And that one was probably started just a few months ago. And then I kind of pushed off meeting with people again until this year. And this year is kind of the new path in that direction. But my advice on this is one, you need to do it. And I don't know what your exercise is, but find something easy. The second is take it slow and steady. Like I am not always a patient person, but I learned through all this experience that you have to take your time. And that's why now my birthday's beginning July, I'm looking at the next six or seven months as being kind of a healing mechanism, a way to kind of allow myself to be better, things like that. And just, it's vital. I mean, I think it both, like I said, it both saved my life and helped give me a better one because I look at life now in in a different manner where it's sort of a quieter place, a peaceful place, a place where I can, it's just a note that this stuff is very, very important and you don't have to go crazy with it. Take your time, be easy, go on long walks, go on runs. If you want to get really aggressive, do what Mark did and, uh, you know, swim across the the water near Golden Gate Bridge. But that's the big thing is like, you need to get active and it's going to help a lot. And you can talk to different therapists about this stuff and whatever, but it kind of gives you your life back. Allows you to experience something that's very connected to nature. And again, the biggest thing for me was both exercise and just staying out of sort of the public eye for a little while because I'm pretty outgoing, but I wasn't then. And that was just very helpful. And that was a number of months we did that. And again, going back to these pictures, left one is me out of surgery, middle one is me at Thanksgiving, the same year, we hiked up the whole thing. And the right is the family we built. So my wife, Alicia, is there, and my daughter, Skylar. And then that's our newborn walker. We had, you know, just a, a year and a few months after surgery. And it just goes to show that, like, as hard as this is, and I'm not bragging, but we found my surgery years early, and two different doctors I talked to said they couldn't do it. But UCSF's amazing, and we built it back. And it was very hard, but it's like, it's worth it. You can build a beautiful life with it. And you know, get the help you need, get get references you want, but just find an easy path. Take your time. Don't go crazy. Take a few months. Honestly, give yourself two or three months to build a path in. And by the end of those three months, you'll feel very different. You'll feel better as a person. You'll feel more active and your body will be in good shape, which I firmly believe actually helps us fight this disease. Um, and we'll see how that plays out. But that's sort of the story that like exercise really did more than help. It kind of gave my life back and now I can be more active and functional. I mean, considering I had my second brain surgery less than a year ago and here I am talking, that's kind of an important thing. So again, exercise, get out, be slow and steady, be easy, and then just find your connection with, you know, the spirit of life and, and the unity and all those things. And you can actually build this into a oddly better life than you started with. And the last thing I'll say is simply that if you don't, if you do cancer as an enemy, you're always fighting with something inside of you that I won't say you can't beat, but it's hard. Look at it as just a part of who you are and look at yourself as the one that you need to work through, your own self. And that's where I get this is that I was in a place where I wasn't happy, but I could build that back up. And it was not through hating cancer. It was through trusting my own body and building the strength just to have a normal, regular life. And it gave me back all the things I've missed and it kind of made me a more compassionate person. So that's just my advice on this. Exercise, go slow and steady, get all the help you can get and just build your life back in a way that that you enjoy that you love and it's all possible and again this year's a new year for me i'm excited about it last year was incredibly difficult but this year we can get through this when we build a great life so that's what i have uh happy to take questions later but uh, i will pass it back to the crew now and i'm glad you all are here it's great thank you so much will and thank you mark and i'm going to turn it over to uh dr wonders again for a few more slides on safety and getting started. Thank you. 
Okay, I just wanted to talk briefly on some global contraindications regarding safety and beginning an exercise program, particularly if you are not currently engaged in some type of activity or exercise program. Um, so in general, rehabilitation management for impairments and disabilities due to brain cancers should be approached the same way as a non-cancerous neurological disease. So I've invited Kim Smith, um, who's a colleague of mine, to come on here, and she's been answering some questions in the Q&A. She'll be available afterwards as well. Kim has a vast knowledge in working with individuals that have neurologic diseases and has helped me put together much of this presentation today. So I think that's important to note that you can approach exercise just as any non-cancerous neurological disease. Um, individual would do. However, it is important that the pathology of the tumor and anticipated course of disease progression should be considered when developing rehabilitation goals and a time frame. And I think you heard that today from our survivor, um, from both of our survivors who talked about um, making sure that you're patient with yourself in terms of the time frame that you have and making sure that your goals are going to be realistic and attainable to what you're able to do now in this particular stage of life. The goal, the overall goal of the exercise program should be to restore or maximize your independence with activities of daily living, as well as maximizing your mobility, your cognition, and your ability to communicate. Um, therefore, exercise interventions, as I went over in my presentation earlier, they are considered safe and they may be applied at any stage of the disease, keeping in mind that as the disease in, in the stages of illness advance, the specific rehabilitation goals might need to be changed and just being patient with yourself, with your current stage and where you are and um, not getting frustrated with yourself, just giving yourself that grace and trying to be patient um, given whatever stage of illness that you are. So for example, if the tumor progression has caused a decline in functional skills, exercise can then assume a supportive role and you can adjust those goals to accommodate any persistent anatomic and physiological limitations that you might be experiencing. Um, likewise, during any terminal stages of illness, then palliative uh, care and exercises can still be done to improve or maintain comfort and quality of life. And that can continue on all the way up until the end of life. It is important to keep in mind that even a small, low-grade brain tumor may cause significant functional deficits, particularly depending on where it resides, if it resides in a critical location. Um, in particular, lesions that are located near the brain stem can be damaging to motor functions, sensory functions, coordination, and cranial nerves, and that should just be taken into consideration during the exercise program. And we'll talk through some adjustments that you can make and some different things that you can do to ensure your safety when you're exercising. All exercise interventions should be guided by the nature and the behavior of your tumor, your ongoing clinical course, and your neurological status. Um, and again, that's why one of the things that I preach probably most of all is the individualization of exercise and just how important that is, because it's not going to be a one size fits all. It has to be unique to you, to your strengths, to your weaknesses, to your goals, and to your current state on that particular day. So... If you want to get started with an exercise program, which hopefully if you are not currently involved with an exercise program, now we have convinced you that it can help and it can be beneficial for you. Of course, um, you know, at Maple Tree, which is the organization that I run, we promote individualized exercise programming. So each exercise program focuses on your individual strengths, weaknesses, goals, limitations, everything. And the way that we recommend that this happen is first to obtain physician's clearance, and that way we can know of any limitations or contraindications that you may have. From there, um, a medical professional should review your cancer and medical history. 
And then I always recommend starting off with a fitness assessment. Um, a fitness assessment is a great way that we can directly measure your strengths and your weaknesses. And so the way that we would do it is we would look at your cardiovascular endurance. This can involve anything walking on a treadmill to a bike or um, even, you know, the, the um, just as simple as you getting up out of a chair and taking a couple of steps. We can look at that to determine um, any functional limitations there. We can also look at muscular strength and muscular endurance. We can look at balance, posture. Ability. We really want to get a well-rounded picture of you. And then based on that, then an, an exercise prescription is created. And that exercise prescription is going to address everything that was measured during that fitness assessment. And it basically tells you the goals of the exercise program. So the exercise program is the piece when you actually do the exercise part and that's either meeting with a trainer, doing that supervised or, you know, doing some exercises at home provided or, you know, taking some safety precautions and, you know, you're, you're staying within the bounds of, of, of safety constraints. Um, and, you know, I program would incorporate aerobic resistance training, which is like weightlifting, flexibility and balance exercise. I always tell people you should never exercise to a point of pain. And I think that's important to mention because I know there's that saying out there that says no pain, no gain. That is not what we would recommend. Um, we want to make sure that what you're doing is comfortable and it, it should be an enjoyable experience. Oftentimes I talk to um, people who are undergoing cancer treatment and they've never exercised before. And sometimes, you know, I once had a patient tell me that she was more afraid to come and do exercise than she was to go through chemotherapy. And that is not what we want. We want people to, to know that exercise is just here to help you and to make you feel better. So we don't want you to have any pain at all while you're doing um, an exercise program. And again, we talked about, you know, you should, you don't want to push yourself too much. You want this to be a good experience for you. Not at home, um, you can try walking for five to 10 minutes at a time. Sometimes this can be a been involved in an exercise program before, you know, I started in, um, after my grandfather battled and fatigue was so intense for him. And sometimes all he was able to do was just walk around the downstairs of his house. Um, but even that little bit of exercise really, really did improve his quality of life It improved his mood and it gave him energy to eat when he, before that was too tired to even eat, um, even be fed. Like we would try to feed him and he was too tired for that. So, um, you know, start small, try walking 10 to five, you know, five to 10 minutes at a time, make sure that when you're doing that, you're wearing proper footwear and take precautions to minimize your risk of falling. Um, and then that kind of leads me to the next. And then the final thing that I'm going to mention here is um, when it comes to balance, you know, a lot of cancer related treatments and side effects can contribute to balance abnormalities. This can be the result, as I said, of the treatment and of the side effects, but also it can be exacerbated by poor nutrition. So I mentioned my grandfather and his inability to eat towards the end of his life. Um, so that definitely is a contributor to um, balance abnormalities. In addition to that, anemia, anxiety, um, postural hypotension, so getting dizzy if you stand up too fast, and dehydration can all negatively impact your balance. There are, are also certain medications and radiation therapy that can cause not only issues with balance, but intermittent vertigo. And so therefore, it's important that you have a fitness program that includes functional movements and balance, um, and that will help you to improve on your balance um, as you go through these exercises.
Um, whenever we're talking about balance, just kind of for, for your own knowledge, I, I, I enjoy learning like what is going to contribute to my balance and how can I work on improving that? So the brain uses three systems for balance. You have the vestibular, the vision and the proprioception. Now due to neurological changes, it's important to incorporate activities that are going to activate all of those different aspects of the brain. And so I have a list here at the end of this webinar, Kim is going to lead you in some exercises that you can try at home on your own um, that don't require any equipment. Um, they're, they're safe for you to do. We'll give you some modifications. But in general, all of these exercises that are listed here on this particular slide are things that you can also do at home. Um, and, and they don't incorporate any type of equipment other than you, you probably should use a chair or something sturdy for support. But all of these exercises can help improve your balance. And so we have standing and simply standing with your eyes open and standing still. That requires balance. And you can challenge yourself by then closing your eyes while you're standing, not moving anything else, just opening your eyes and closing your eyes. And that can help you to improve your balance. Um, standing on variable surfaces. So if you have a carpeted area or a hardwood floor, that would be a variable surface. Um, I know I have a gravel driveway. So even standing on that gravel, that rough, you know, the roughness under my feet, of course, I need to wear shoes when I do that. So I'd recommend wearing shoes so you don't hurt your feet. Um, making intentional head movements. And so that can be something where, again, I would first do this standing, but moving your head from side to side. And then you can do that with your eyes closed as well. And that's something else that you can do to help improve your balance. Um, now, making your head movements while your eyes are focused on a specific object is another way you can do that. Um, and then finally, narrowing your stance. And so when we're talking about that, we're looking at your base of support. So the base of support is everything on your body that's touching the ground. The larger your base of support, the more stability you have. So if you think of an infant learning how to crawl, you know, they're going to start with the maximum base of support, usually their army crawling. So they're up on their arms, but then they have the rest of their body on the ground. So that's a large base of support. Then it's a big deal for that infant to be able to push up onto all fours. So now they only have four points of contact with the floor. They have their hands and they have their knee. So that going from an army crawl to that is making their base of support just a little bit smaller. It's gonna require more stability. It's gonna activate different muscles in order to maintain that. And then, of course, standing, then that is the ultimate test of your of your balance and of your base of support. And you'll notice with infants, when they first stand and when they first start to take their first steps, um, their their feet are, are pointed outwards. So usually they have their feet a little bit wider than shoulder width apart, their toes rotated outward. And, and what's that, what that is doing is that is maximizing their base of support as they're standing. So the more you bring your feet closer together, the more you turn your toes so that they're parallel with each other, you're narrowing your stance and you're helping to improve your stability. On the other side, if you are experiencing some problems with balance and maybe standing has become difficult for you, then you can try widening your base of support a little bit, maybe rotate your toes out a little bit. Sometimes even lowering your center of gravity may help you as well. So these are tricks that you can use on the opposite side as well. Um, that that is that's all I have. So I think now we're going to turn it into um, a question and answer um, section. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Wonders, and to all of our panelists. I'm going to invite you back on to turn your video on, and I'm going to invite all the, uh, the all of those of you who are watching this to submit more questions. You can submit it in the Q&A, and we will cover as many as we can until we do our uh, after the show exercise uh, together. So while we're waiting for people to submit questions, um, I wanted to let everyone know that for UCSF uh, brain tumor patients, we have two programs that you are 
welcome to join. We are just doing one right now called Headstrong. It's a four class series with Reagan Fedrick. And we're doing many of the uh, exercises that um, Dr. Wonders was mentioning, um, including a whole class just on balance and stability. Um, so that is, we're going to be, we're finishing up uh, the, the January series. We're going to be doing it again in April. So if you're interested in your UCSF uh, brain tumor patient, please uh, feel free to uh, email me or check back for those classes. And also we have a yoga class that is taught by one of our survivors. Um, and this class will be starting in February. And so we in invite you to join that. It's a wonderful class with cat shots. So um, I see a question coming in here in the Q&A. Um, all right, so here's a question. Who in a patient's care team is generally prescribing or teaching these exercises to patients? Or is it more of a general, or are these more general recommendations given to the patient to incorporate throughout treatments? So I, I think maybe, you know, Dr. Wonders, I'll, I'll maybe address this to you. So who is... Who do you see kind of in an ideal world or just in terms of what's happening right now as the person that a patient might go to to help recommend some of these exercises? Right. That's a really great question because you want to make sure that whoever you're working with has some type of specialty certification to work with a cancer population. And so in general at Maple Tree, what I look for is at least a four year degree in an exercise science or related field. Um, ACSM, the American College of Sports Medicine, also has an additional clinical exercise physiologist certification that we recommend. And basically, the clinical exercise physiologist uh, certification basically helps someone with a baseline degree to be able to work then with a clinical population. And then we at Maple Tree have an additional certification that we have our trainers go through that is in addition to working with a clinical population. We want the, these individuals to know specifically how to work with a cancer population and all of the unique ins and outs of that. And so all of our trainers, we want to make sure they have those three levels of education and verification. Um, not everywhere has that. And so if you're going to like a fitness center or, you know, like someone that you met who might have a background in exercise science, I would ask them, um, other than Maple Tree, there are other organizations that provide certifications in oncology. So I would have that distinction before working with them. Thank you very much. Um, Kim, do you have anything to add? or Mark in terms of your healthcare team, who you know? I was going to say the same thing. So yes, looking okay. for like um, certifications that emphasize the importance of education prior to just not like a weekend certification or something like that. So got it. And, and Mark, maybe I'll just uh, jump on that and ask you from your perspective, um, how has your medical team uh, been with, you know, your activity? How, how have they been accepting of it, encouraging of it? What's that been like for you? They have. And it, <clears throat> at many points during my progression, I would reach out to my neuro-oncologist or others just to double check, is it okay if I try this? And the answer was generally, if you're safe about it and you think you're ready for it, um, there is no um, research that shows otherwise. Um, uh, earlier this spring, uh, we like many of you, I, I was I found a new lease on life with my daughters, and um, one of my older daughter really wanted to go to Nepal, so we went hiking at altitude. You know, it's sort of eighteen, nineteen thousand feet. And I talked to my team and said, before I do that, um, you know, is there any concerns that or or, or worries that you might have? And, and they did some quick research and came back to me and said, look, we've looked around, and and there's no indication that this should be a problem. Be careful and. Um, you know, I, I do take some precautions when I exercise, especially when I'm doing a longer run. Um, um, it, it's not based on my medical team, but I always kind of carry a vial of Ativan with me just in case. Um, but, but there's, you know, I haven't, besides just running it by them um, to let people know what I was planning to do, I, I haven't had a lot of specific direction for my team, just a lot of encouragement. Great. Okay, thank you so much. Um, there's another question regarding sciatica. I'm having painful sciatica right now. How can I get relief so that I can start exercising? Right now, it's just really hard to walk. 
who would like to answer that one? Dr. Wonders or Kim? I, I can okay. address that. So oftentimes when we're looking at general movement, um, even general population, not just individuals going through cancer treatment, um, even just the slightest off step can initiate some imbalance within our SI joints and all of that. So going to like a manual physical therapist who can then go down and look like vertebrae by vertebrae. And if you're going by uh, with different treatments too, you can have some um, laxicity in like your joints and stuff like that. So you want to start exercising. So getting with um, like a a manual physical therapist to, to look at that would be great. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and let's see, here's another one. Uh, do you, how do you address fatalistic attitudes, uh, resistance to exercise PT activity? Have you observed um, more cancer patients being given referrals for physical therapy as a more standard practice to physical therapy rather than to start exercising? I can, I can answer this. And then I think Ken, Kim can probably piggyback off of that, off of what I say. Okay. Um, but yes, we, we definitely have, um, I would say at Maple tree in particular, you know, we have close to 60 locations across the country where we're working with all different types of cancer. Um, 90% of the people we work with have never exercised before. It's, you know, I, as I mentioned in my talk, I, I did have a patient tell me once that she was more afraid to come to Maple Tree than she was to start <laughs> and start her chemotherapy. And so, you know, I think that exercise does go against what you think when you think of cancer. And we work really hard to try to change the narrative and change the story around cancer to show that, you know, yes, you're going to have days where you don't feel well. And that is, that's a normal thing. Um, we operate under the belief that something is always better than nothing. And so even if it's just a walk around the downstairs of your house, that's better than nothing. And so we want to do whatever we can in terms of, you know, should people go to a physical therapist rather than an exercise? I think it really depends on the individual and what their specific concerns and limitations are. Um, physical therapists have a very unique skill set that if you are experiencing functional limitations and range of motion difficulties, that would be the scope of something an exercise physiologist can address, then absolutely you would want to go to a physical therapist. Most of the time, an exercise physiologist can work in parallel to an ex to a physical therapist. And so the physical therapist will address whatever that functional limitation is that you're experiencing. Um, usually it's that specific thing that they're going to work on. Um, and so the experience, the thing that I'm thinking of the most happens like in, in breast cancer in particular, where someone might have a double mastectomy, then of course they have range of motion limitations. They can't raise their arms up overhead. So a physical therapist would come in in that instance and address that specific limitation. The exercise physiologist can work in parallel with the physical therapist and address other issues such as, you know, lower body flexibility, cardiovascular endurance, muscular strength, all of those things. Um, and in fact, we have several locations where we work side by side with physical therapists. And I believe that provides the most comprehensive care for the patient when we can work as a team together. Anything to add? No, I, I completely agree. You know, um, you, you do, you want to have a good healthcare team. It's that continuity of care when it comes to your patients. But I, I fully agree. I've had people that say, well, I've, I've never exercised before. There's no way that I can do this after I've left. I have this port this year. I can't work out when I have that. Well, yeah, we can. We can still do that. So that's what we're here for, to provide that confidence and that support letting them know that, you know, hey, we have done research on this. We know that it's safe and, and your doctor is supporting that. So yes, absolutely. Great. can be done. Thank you so much. And um, Will, now that you're back on, uh, I would love to ask you and Mark um, this question that came through. Um, how do you keep your motivation up for exercising? What do you tell yourself that, that it's really helping you with um, 
yeah. So how do you keep your motivation up for exercising, especially on those days where you're feeling so fatigued and just like you're, you know, hit by a truck? So I'll go on that first. So now I don't didn't mention this, but now I wake up about five in the morning, just normally without an alarm. And I walk about two and a half miles every day. And the days where I'm really tired, I honestly just kind of force myself to do it. The only days I miss is when I was sick or it rained. But it's at those moments, if you push yourself through this, it's a little bit better not to push yourself, but to just find the strength you have to the extent you have it. And a small example of that doesn't have to do with exercise, but it's something I'm writing about where like, as you first start recovering, if you're lying in bed and want a glass of water and you just want to ask someone for it, stop and think about whether you can get it yourself. If you have the energy to do it, even if it's hard, you should. But if you don't, then you ask. And that goes the same way, I think, with the, you know, the dedication to exercise is that you look at it as being honestly like a soul healing exercise, something that makes your entire life a lot better. And a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the stress is a lot of the stuff you have about it. You kind of need to do it to knock that away. And once you do, it might be a few months. You're going to be like, wow, I feel so much better. I love that I can walk five miles. I love that I'm not, you know, winded when I walk upstairs. So my take again is that this isn't a battle against cancer. It's kind of sometimes a battle against yourself. So sometimes when you're weak and tired, don't do too much, but just see what you can do. And if you can't hike a mile, just again, walk around the downstairs, you know, take your dog to play out. Just small, simple things I think will uh, will help you out a lot. So that's my general take is that you should do it, temper it down if needed, understand that you're just understanding yourself better, working with yourself better. And that's who you're not battling, but that's the person that you kind of got to build up. So that is my general take on it because I go through that still every day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Erin, Mark, would you? uh, Yeah, I'll add add a couple of points of mind to that. One is I kind of go back to that that intellectual exercise of remembering that counterintuitively it'll give me more more energy. And it's sometimes like every day I have to remind myself, you know, I know you feel tired, go out there and 10 minutes later, you'll begin to feel that. And that kind of once, and I keep having that same experience. So there's a positive feedback loop for that. And that gets easier, I think. the second point is that, um, yeah, as I mentioned, I've got two, te- I've mentioned obliquely, I have two teenage daughters and I, I kind of look at exercise also as taking care of the rest of my body below my neck. And that I do, you know, I've been given this gift of time with them and I just want to make sure that, you know, I'm keeping, you know, myself in, 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 in good condition for the rest of that. And then lastly, um, and obviously this isn't uh, founded in science, but I believe that the, the body is a somewhat, you know, amazing and almost magical healing machine. I mean, it's, it's very complex system. It's got all sorts of capabilities to, you know, uh, help regulate, you know, different things, uh, parts you know, of our body. It allows us to, you know, um, uh, flush toxins. And I just want to give it every, benefit I can so that it can do its thing. I'm not a physiologist, I don't have a medical degree, but I believe that even something as simple as stress. If I know that stress, lowering stress helps me heal better and exercise um, lowers my stress, well, then it's not that bad. So I guess in some ways I'm saying I intellectualize it. And then that intellectualization is reinforced with results on a constant, Mm -hmm. consistent basis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I don't often hear people that have regretted exercising, right? You don't really hear that. Oh, I wish I wouldn't have exercised. You know, it's, <laughs> um, and so. that's what I was saying, Naomi, that like, yeah. even if it's hard, once I'm done, I'm like, that was a great idea. <laughs> like, <that's laughs> so same right. stuff. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and there's another question that, that came through. Um, how do I know when I am pushing myself too much? Cause there's often talk about like, don't push yourself or don't go past your limit. Like, how do you know what that limit is? Karen, maybe I'll start with you. Sure. I think it's so important that you're even aware of that, that you can self too too much. And in that case, you probably might regret the exercise program. Um, And so I always say, if you're doing something and it's causing you pain or even causing you a little bit of a like, oh, that didn't feel right. Then if that's the case, whatever you're doing, stop. And I would check your form first and foremost, maybe your knee is bending over your toe, maybe you're swinging and you're hurting your back. I mean, there's, there's sometimes there's something very, very little that you might be doing that you might be unaware of. 
most of the studies that I cited all included a supervised component of the exercise program. And so I think it's important to have someone who's trained to watch you and make sure that you're not making any of these form errors. Sometimes it's something like your weight is, you know, if you get to, you're doing repetitions and you get to number six and you feel like if I lift another, another repetition, my arm might fall off. That's probably an indication that much we want you to probably, I mean, I don't, without knowing you specifically, I would say you want to get to 10. And if you feel like, okay, that felt good. I feel a little fatigued, but I, I still feel like I'm going to be able to pick up my pen and write then. Um, so really listen to your body and cues. And if, if you feel like, oh, what was that? That didn't feel right. Chances are maybe, maybe there's a tweak or an adjustment make. Kim, what would you add? I, I think that's absolutely true. We have to pay attention to the type of treatment that the individual is receiving because that could uh, place more fatigue on different muscles. So looking at maybe the types of exercises that we're, that we're going to be completing, depending on the treatment that the individual is receiving. So that's another reason why it's great to have someone, you know, like us within Maple Tree to help the individual make sure that they have um, good exercises that aren't going to um, magnify that fatigue that they're going to feel after treatment. Great. Okay, thank you. And I have one more question here, and this is around exercises that might help, any specific exercise that might help cognitive enhancement. You might've touched on this a little bit, but what type of exercises uh, would those look like? You go for this one. I see your <laughs> smile. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a, another great thing. Um, when you work with uh, a healthcare team, um, we can work with uh, speech therapists that help with cognitive um, improvements and things like that, uh, occupational therapists as well. So we can take all of those things and we can incorporate that into an exercise program. For example, you can um, make a uh, obstacle course and you can hide different words or different things that are within the obstacle course. You're still getting the exercise that you need, but then the patient's going to have to remember to go where was at what color cone was the word. Um, I, I don't know, hair or something like that, whatever it was, or your kids' names, if that's what you're trying to remember, then, you know, the person would have to remember that was, or um, what color was the object that I, that you had to step over the very first piece of equipment that we went over. So those are little things that we can incorporate into an exercise program as well. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. I hadn't heard that before. Um, all right. Well, great. Well, I know we're kind of at time right now. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today to help us understand this, to help inspire us, uh, to help motivate us. And I think um, we all have something that we can take with us in, in terms of going forward and incorporating into our, our lives. So thank you so much. Thank you.